Well, we're, we're ending things and beginning things. We are ending with the big picture. Maybe we should have begun with the big picture, but uh, we've got two guys who really understand the big picture, one an economist, another a geostrategist. So uh, I think we'll begin thinking historically. Um, Moritz, hmm. are we at a, a Gutenberg moment in world history when it comes to AI? Is it about to transform the world in the same radical exciting, bloody way that Gutenberg's <laughs> press changed history? I think so, Andrew, totally. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's comparable to the invention of book printing and probably beyond in the sense that there is an immense, a t enormous uh, opportunity to share knowledge, to create new knowledge, to, to uh, generate new ideas. I think there's, from an economic point of view, there's, there's, there's really two things. One is this creation of, uh, of new uh, ways of, of distilling knowledge, of bringing it out in the world. That's and then linked to that, of course, the, the, the opportunities for automation productivity gains. But then there's a big unknown, which we are all excited about, and which might be a real game changer, which we don't know yet, which is the, is so the creative uh, energy and the creative opportunities that come with generative AI, the new ideas that drive future growth. That we don't this, know, but it could be big. Right. Is this an unknown unknown or a known unknown? I think, I think the known unknown is that AI will change uh, the workplace, will change economies uh, by, through its effect on automation, on tasks that are going to be done now by AI, so no longer by humans, that will have consequences. But we've done automation before. The question is, like, how much will that change and how quickly and how do we manage that? And which interests are in the way of that? You know, this time it's about doctors and lawyers and they have power and influence, so they might try to slow things down. And then there's an unknown unknown, which is like, what are the new ideas? What growth is going to come through new ideas that humans hadn't thought about, that the AI is not going to tell us, why don't you do it this way, and what productivity and growth we can unlock through that? Well, not to be outdone, we've talked about a, a possible Gutenberg moment in economic terms, but the man of the summer is, of course, Robert Oppenheimer, and I think that um, uh, Benedict believes, perhaps, that we're at an Oppenheimer moment when it comes to geostrategy and warfare in terms of uh, the revolutionary potential of generative AI. Are we at a, a, an O moment, mm -hmm. Benedict? Uh, yes and no, Andrew. Um, how many of you have seen Oppenheimer, the movie? Success. Okay. There we go. So Oppenheimer moment is the moment when you realize that there is a choice between continuing with uh, developing a technology or stopping for humanity's sake. And I think, you know, we are at an Oppenheimer moment in as much as that we're facing a technology we don't fully understand. We feel there are enormous, enormous benefits to be had, but there are also potentially lethal risks. Same as with the, the atomic bomb. I don't think we're in an Oppenheimer moment for one other reason, and that is, you know, Pandora's box is open. We always pretend, and people in this room today have pretended that we still have a choice that you can still regulate this. Pandora's box is wide open, it's out. And so I think the only chance that we have is to do with this Oppenheimer moment what our predecessors did with the last, namely make sure that we focus and massively invest in the positive uses of then nuclear energy and now AI, and that we ostracize the use of AI weapons just as we've ostracized the use of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. And whatever people think, we've been pretty successful the last 70 years doing that. Well, Christopher Nolan, who directed uh, Oppenheimer, suggested we're at an Oppenheimer moment in terms of... He should uh, know. Uh, uh, well, he made the movie. At least I didn't ask you if we were at a Barbie moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. but, but coming back to Oppenheimer, the movie is about human agency, and Oppenheimer's inability to shape history as he wanted. He was a victim rather than a, um, uh, an author of history, given AI and authors of that, that is, of course, uh, ironic. Uh, are you hopeful, Benedict, that this Oppenheimer moment 2.0 will allow us humans to author our own history a little bit m with more agency than we did uh, with nuclear energy, nuclear technology? I think, you know, the main difference between the Oppenheimer moment now and the Oppenheimer moment in the middle of the Second World War is that then it was governments driving the Oppenheimer moment. It was governments taking the decisions. And now 
it is companies, it's individuals taking the decisions. And I, I think the jury is still out whether they will do a better job than uh, the states or the governments did. I, I'm just convinced that the advantages of AI massively outweigh the disadvantages, but that we must not ignore the disadvantages. And in fact, you know, this has been sort of a happy-go-lucky conference, which is brilliant. This is why people love DLD. Okay, okay, okay. It's very, very German, this yeah. conference. <laughs> no, but the, the point being, um, sort of creative, intelligent minds have a tendency to focus on the chances uh, and, and the hopes. And there are some enormous risks involved. And if we now make the mistake, and I'm sorry for the long answer, if we now make the mistake to regulate, uh, to focus too much um, on, on certain aspects, uh, we run the risk of being overtaken by the illiberals in this world, who will have a heyday with the um, instruments uh, that AI affords them with. And so, am I hopeful? Yes, I am, but I'm also scared. It keeps me up at night if I think about what China and Russia can do with some of these things. Well, I want to talk about China and Russia later, but Moritz, uh, you're a very distinguished uh, German economist, previous distinguished German economists have often imagined that we don't have a lot of agency when it comes to the making of our history. One famous German economist argued that we make our own history, but not quite in the way we imagined. What room is given to agency with this new technology? Do we have much choice, do you think, with your economist cap on? Can we choose our future, or is AI inevitable un and unavoidable? Gosh, that's a big question for an economist. Um, so uh, let me let me start by saying I, I completely agree with Benedict's analysis that uh, we can the, the, the history clearly economic history clearly teaches us we you can't stand in the way you have to embrace it you have to open it and that gives you the agency I mean there's this uh, anecdote from 19th century Britain the Brits were late in developing the car industry because they had a regulation that they were worried about the, the, the pedestrians, so in front of every car there had to be a little human waving a flag warning the pedestrians that a car was coming. Obviously that kind of slowed down the, um, the advantages that uh, cars bring and the productivity that comes from that. So I think the agency, if we want to keep it, is in, 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 in allowing that uh, creative energy to flow and that research to go ahead, but making sure that we shape it in a direction that ultimately increases human freedom, human liberty. I think that should still be the end goal of what we do. And, and like then increase in the amount of choice and freedom in the world. And when we touch the point where AI threatens that, we have to, we have to think again, I guess. Benedict, earlier you, you were on my uh, podcast show and we talked a little bit about John Stuart Mill and his notions of liberalism. Is this a good moment? for liberals who believe in individual freedom. You brought up the Russians and the Chinese and the havoc you believe they will unleash with today's AI. Is it a good time to be alive as a liberal in the age of this AI revolution? I think it is. Um, we, we were talking about the systemic competition between those that believe in the international rules-based order and those that do not, that want to undermine it, erode it, reinterpret it. And, and the point is, the one thing that we in the West, that we in the liberal world have, that makes us inherently attractive to those suppressed, is the idea of individual freedom, the liberal thoughts that Mill uh, formulated. And that is our sort of hardest shield and sharpest sword. And I think we should carry it in front of us like a sort of the holy grail and, and use it not only as something to hide behind, but something that makes us incredibly attractive. People want to come to Europe, people want to live here, how many people are trying to flee to Russia? How many people are trying to flee to China? In including tech people, mm. you know? The, I mean, we have such an enormous advantage here that I think Mill was right with almost everything that, that he said at that time. Mill, of course, argued that we make ourselves, we choose to shape ourselves according to our careers as lawyers and doctors and writers and poets and filmmakers and musicians, but... Um, Moritz, mm. what happens when we don't have those choices? What happens when we have smart machines that do all those things? What happens to human freedom and what happens to our sense of the self? Easy uh, question. Easy course. question, again, one for me. Um, look, I think 
the, the promise of AI and the, the, the promise I also believe in as a macroeconomist is we know that what drives growth, what drives living standards is the generation of new ideas, of new ways of doing things, combining what's out there. And obviously, we have this big climate challenge as well that we need to, an energy challenge that we need to solve. Um, and I think AI has lots of promise and that, that growth enhances freedom and we don't have to maybe spend quite as much time working and we can spend time more, more time with our kids and or reading good books or, or listening to music. What makes life, you know, in a, a And enjoy. it's what um, uh, Albert Wenger, another old time DLD friend, called the world after capital. Exactly. But, and I think this is sort of also my, the political economist in me, we know that we have to manage the process of technology adoption very well. It can disrupt societies, it can lead to large inequalities, it can lead to um, resistance that um, I think we've seen some of this with the anti-globalization movement in, in recent years that had e even you know, elected an American president on a ticket of, of America first. Um, so we, we in the, I think this is, this is one of the big lessons of the 20th century in the interest of getting sustained growth and living standards, productivity, adoption, openness to trade, openness to new technologies, we need to do something to distribute the gains of that fairly in the interest of keeping societies open and allowing this generation to go on. I mean, that goes without saying, uh, Moritz, and I've heard that from everyone I've interviewed, everyone I've talked to at the show, but no one knows how to do that. How would you suggest? I mean, I guess uh, one, one point is, is that you need, you need a, a, a lean but strong state. Uh, I think this is one of the liberal, maybe w w one of the points where liberals in the past 30 years were a little bit too, too, too fast in concluding that um, it's, better, uh, it's better for the state to do as, less, as, as little as possible because then the state can do less harm. Uh, I think we, we see now that in many aspects we lacking the state capacity to actually implement the necessary infrastructure, to implement the, the, the regulation, to implement um, also the, um, you know, the, 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 the green transition and, and, and the energy transition. So I think we need to reconceptualize the state in, 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 that, in that respect. And um, we will uh, end up in a, in a, otherwise we will end up in a situation where we Kind of have this very strange sort of dichotomy between amazing technological possibilities and the very limited uh, political capacity to to deal and live in, in these societies. Um, so there is uh, one easy word is I think there is no way around um, having a fair tax system that uh, also um, gives makes those who benefit most from the innovation from the productivity gains uh, pay a fair share. And is that uh, capitalism? Is it circular capitalism? Is it social capitalism? Everyone has different words for it, but no one really knows what it is. Is it socialism? Yeah. No, it's not socialism. I think, I, think, I mean, if, if, if the word wasn't so branded and so associated with like 1970s style welfare states, I think some form of like social democracy in a broad term, not associated with any particular party, is, is, um, is, is the most successful societal model that we have developed so far that keeps the conditions under which open societies flourish sustainably. If we can continue that under climate change, I know there are some people who say like we, there's only an authoritarian option left, but authoritarian regimes, they all fail eventually. They never solve the succession problem. They never have a good mechanism to select good replacements or good people around the one leader. You know, the leader always has an interest in keeping everyone around him small and selects, uh, you know, not this much. So I don't, I don't really see an alternative. Um, in other words, the world should become like Germany. Yeah, or Denmark's a nice place. Denmark? Yeah. You know. I was here in Denmark. <laughs> uh, you remember when uh, Hil Hillary Clinton and uh, Bernie Sanders were arguing in, in one of their debates and Bernie was going on and on about Denmark this and Denmark that and Hillary turned to him and said, in her school marmally way, said, America will never be Denmark. So, <laughs> Benedict, are, are we, we are now really to the big picture. Yeah, we're really we? big picture. Here. Yeah, well, but can we? I mean, someone was saying to me earlier, we need to become more like Wales or Scotland, where it rains the whole time. I mean, realistically, can large countries like the United States or Germany become like Wales or Denmark or Norway? I mean, these are just pipe dreams, aren't they? I mean, it's not really bound up with AI. Maybe AI can help us with that. This is for you. 
<laughs> it, it sort of reminds me. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of the joke. You know what's the biggest or the, the fastest way to become a millionaire? It's to be a billionaire and buy an airline. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, you know, to be more serious, that there are books about the, the rise and fall of great nations. And so, you know, it, I think it's perfectly possible for the US to end up like Wales. Not that I dislike Wales. Um, but I mean, I, 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 I think there are some, some more serious points. Are there any Welsh people here? <laughs> I can even say something in Wales. Um, one of the things that you mentioned briefly was you know, the role of the state. And I think in your podcast, you asked the question, what's the role of companies? Should they be invited yeah. to the table? Mm -hmm. Should they be you know, granted executive power, given that they really drive this development? And then we talked about, you know, should we maybe clip the wings of these companies a little here and there? And I then used the example of the East India Company to say that you know, when the East India Company became too powerful, its wings were clipped. It may be a little more like the, the Knights Templar, I thought, mm -hmm. after our, um, our little talk. You may remember the end of the Knights Templar. They became too powerful, and uh, the French king then decided to all burn them at the stake. Um, I, I don't think that the US or the European Union will now start burning tech companies at the stake. But the point is, there is absolutely no way that they will be invited to the decision-making table. I think they should be included much more in the way that, that we deal with tech policy. But at the end, it's the role of the state, coming back to your question, to make sure that we have the right guardrails, that the use of lethal AI is ostracized, mm -hmm. and that the development of constructive and productive AI is incentivized. But That's Benedict, is that, and it's, a, it's a nice idea, but is it realistic in an age where you have multi-trillion dollar tech companies like Apple and Google and Amazon and Microsoft in an age where the American state at best is, is withering away, which lacks, completely lacks legitimacy and credibility. Ian Bremer and Mustafa, um, uh, 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 Mustafa uh, Suleiman, the co-founder of DeepMind, just wrote an interesting piece suggesting that tech companies need a place at the table. The world has changed from the 19th century. Why shouldn't these tech companies, who have invented this miraculous technology, this new way of doing the world, why shouldn't they have a place at the table next to some doddering old guy like, uh, like Joe Biden? Um, shall I respond? I think it's one for you. Yeah, That's one, one, for, one for the team. Um, I strongly believe that while I do love Ian Bremmer and Mustafa Suleiman, that they're totally on, as we say in Germany, Holzpfad, that they've, they've sort of taken the wrong turn. That, 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 that is, there is absolutely no chance uh, hell will freeze over before companies driven by a profit consideration, which is what they should be driven by, that's what they're there for, will make policy decisions. That's just, to that, you know, it's the totally wrong way to do this. And you know, just, just to raise one example, can you remember the moment when Elon Musk threatened to switch off Starlink and uh, the, sort of the Ukrainian soldiers in the trenches moment, yeah. suddenly, you know, were, were left wondering whether they had a chance to, to radio back home to headquarters the next day? I, you know, the, 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 the profit consideration there was perfectly fine. Elon Musk said, hey, everyone else pays for my services. Why shouldn't the Ukrainian soldiers in the trench? But at the end, that's really not his decision. And that actually means we, as the state, we as the security community, need to make sure that we become less dependent on the private sector. It cannot be, and it must not be, that we're dependent on a crazy billionaire somewhere to make sure that our troops can talk with each other. And so, um, Morris, do you, do, do you agree? agree? Absolutely agree. It's no, no question. I think also this, this image, like if you, if you look back, like sort of 19th century industrialization, these big industrial companies, the Krupps and Thyssen, like in, in, in Germany, they also wielded enormous political power, but there was always a consideration that the public interests go first, and uh, in the end, this is, these are the, the legitimacy comes from, from, from the political process, and I think there's no alternative. We can't have like idiosyncratic. Um, um, and people making these uh, momentous decisions, absolutely. So we have the state dominating this table in terms of managing and regulating this new technology. We have tech companies perhaps not invited. What about the people? What about 
the audience, you and I and everybody else, what role should we have in determining whether or not this revolutionary new technology, whether it's our Gutenberg moment or our, our Oppenheimer moment, what role should we have in determining the futures of our kids and the children of our children? Obviously, um, you start. Uh, okay, no, obviously, obviously a big role. It's, it's, it's our future to shape, and I think the main obstacle that I see in, I mean, definitely in this country, but, but all around the world is sort of this resistance to embrace the change. And I think we really have to work hard on, on changing mentalities, on, especially in Europe, on breaking down sort of this mentality that this is something imposed on you. We can, we should embrace that, we should change that, we should be open to change and uh, not, um, which is, kind of seems to be often like a sort of standard reaction whoever you talk to is to raise doubts and concerns about stuff. I think as legitimate as that is, um, there is no future and no, 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 no way to solve the problems ahead of us by rejecting technology. So there is an alternative to openness and a constructive process. Bernard, um, Bernadette? I now have one minute and 40 seconds for a passionate plea for democracy. But I mean, the point is pretty clear. The role of everyone here, you're all citizens yeah. of liberal democratic states, I guess. Um, you know, vote for the party that makes the, the best argument when it comes to tech. Uh, if you're not happy with the offer, run for office yourself. Uh, otherwise, you run the risk of being ruled by people that are less intelligent than you and less committed and, and less uh, idealistic. And hence, I think the question is pretty clear. Everyone has agency and everyone can stand up and make a point. I mean, you know, we have the, the climate cluers out there. There are like maybe 30 of them and they're making a point. I may not like it, I certainly do not like it, but they're standing up and they're making a point and everyone else can too. So I don't, I don't see the, the role of the individual in any way or form diminished lately. On the contrary, I think it's much more prevalent and, and clear for all to see. I, just, I mean, I do think we have to, with this automation drive, with AI, against the background that our democracies are in, not in a good state. Oh, the at risk are, of being manipulated by AI. We are in a bad state, so we need to be like, you asked this question about how do we deal with it, how do we do this. I would see this as like some redistribution of the gains, there's an insurance, pay, insurance down payment on democratic stability, on openness, and on, on sort of sustainability also yeah. of the political process. We're not doing, after 30 years of globalization, and all kinds of other things, the, the Western democratic societies are not in a good space right now. And, and I think we need to take that seriously. Benedict, would you agree? Always. Seven seconds left. Can't say more. Final question. I'm going to cheat and <laughs> add a minute or two. Um, give me some, it's all about, all about democracy, blah, blah, and changing the economic system. In two or three years when we meet back here and we're dealing with a new wave of radical technology, give me a couple of things that can be done in the next year or two, both of you. Uh, Benedict, you might start. Two, uh, one, one or two things that are concrete, that are not abstract. Okay, some of you may have heard of the Competitive Studies Project run by Eric Schmidt and Bob Work. It looked at the sort of seven layers of artificial intelligence and it looked at where is China, where is Russia ahead of the US and Europe. And it turns out that, you know, we are behind on four of these seven layers. And there are some very, very concrete recommendations in there. And while we must do everything to sort of, you know, get our regulations right and get our incentive schemes right, we must make sure that we won't get overtaken by those that mean less well than we do. And, you know, if you want to be concrete, look at that list, a uh, perfect list. Mm. And finally, look, uh, I'm a macroeconomist. You asked me about micro inventions, but I, I really enjoyed Ludwig's talk earlier, and he, he gave this great outlook of what's going to come. And yeah, I think that it was very good. That personal assistant that's with me and collects ideas and connects them and reminds me of stuff, and is like I can talk to privately and say like, mm, maybe I don't want to do this late. Uh, that, I mean, if that's there in two years, I'll be I'll be delighted to have it. Well, for the moment, we've just got Steffi. <laughs> yeah, you're our virtual what assistant. I have to say, um, my, my heart, my assistant boss, the session is over. Thank you very much. This was great. It was a wonderful